Wonderful. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Katie Williams, and I'm with uh, the DC Office of the State Superintendent of Education, and I'm in the Division of Data Accountability and Research, and I'm, you know, we're holding this webinar today to review the pre-appeals data and how to access that data in SLED, and also to make sure that everyone is comfortable with the tools that we've provided to help aid your review of the data to ensure that uh, all the data are accurate and you're able to submit the appeals needed if necessary. Thank you all. Now, as we proceed through this webinar, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the question box. I'll stop periodically to address them, but I'm going to um, you know, try to keep going as much as possible and just stop at, at, at good break points to answer any of your questions. So thank you. All right. So the purpose of the webinar, like I said, is uh, to go over the different tools available for LEAs because the enrollment audit data are super important. The data are considered authoritative and they're used as a source for public reporting in the future for uh, what will exist for 2015-16 for years to come, both for those audited data fields that reflect that have funding implications, but also for the student demographic fields and other data points that don't necessarily have funding implications. This will include uh, the 2015-16 equity reports and the 2016 park reports. Additionally, we're holding this webinar now because it's the last opportunities to raise new issues prior to the finalization of the 2015-16 audit. Uh, LEAs are not allowed to submit requests for in-person appeals for issues that weren't already raised through the desktop appeals process. So we're quickly going to review an overview of the uh, timeline for this point forward. Then we're going to review how to access the audit results in SLED. Then I'm going to provide a demonstration of the tools in SLED available to support your review, such as drop-down filters, uh, delta fields, and reason fields. Next, we're going to review the appeal submission process. And finally, we'll leave some time for questions. So here is a chart that shows the overview of the updated timeline. So on Wednesday, December 16th, the pre-appeals audit data was released in SLED, including the at-risk numbers. From the 17th until January 5th, 2016, LEAs have the opportunity to review the data and identify any issues that may exist with the data. If any discrepancies are identified, LEAs must submit appeals through the desktop appeals process to ask that the data be corrected. If all your data are correct, then no further action is needed. On, on January 5th, the deadline for the appeals process, and then from the 6th to the 15th, the auditor and Aussie will reviews, review the appeals submitted and make determinations. After that point, Aussie will publish the results on January 19th in SLED for LEAs to review. And then the following day, LEAs need to submit requests for in-person appeals to Aussie. Aussie will hold those appeals January 21st and January 22nd. Question, is the deadline 5 p.m. on January 5th, 6 p.m., or 11.59 p.m. The deadline is going to be 11.59 p.m. on January 5th. No 5 p.m. deadline. So now I'm going to show you how to access your data in SLED, the results. This is, uh, the data are published in the exact same place that the data were published leading up to October 5th. So the, the guidance is the same. You go to sled.dc.gov, you log in with your SLED credentials, and then along the top navigation bar, there's a drop-down menu for programs. When you select that drop-down menu, you'll see enrollment audit, which is circled in red in the drop-down in the screenshot below. From that, you can select the LEA summary, or you can select student level. So 
Sorry, just moving back to the last side, um, there was a question, is it the 1222 deadline that has been moved to 1-5? Yes, that is correct. The 1222 deadline is, has, is now January 5th. So the summary level reports in SLED, this is the LEA summary view here. There's the UPSFF summary report, and that shows the number of students enrolled and attending DC public and public charter schools, as those are the students who are eligible for the uniform per student funding formula payments. The data are broken down by school and by the key funding categories. This, this table reflects the results of the initial, the preliminary results from the enrollment audit and gives LEAs a quick sense of how many students are being counted for each category. And then there's the child count summary report, which reflects the findings from the 2015-16 uh, annual student enrollment audit for individuals with Disabilities Education Act eligible population. We are not going to be discussing that in depth today. This is focused on the findings from the general enrollment audit, but I did want to highlight that it's there and also subject to appeal. So discussing uh, the enrollment audit report, the summary report, this is what it looks like. Again, as I was saying, it shows each funded element and also uh, a total by school level and a total by LEA across the bottom. You can hide, sort, filter columns by selecting these drop-down menus. And all the students enrolled at each school should add up to your LEA total. You can also export this report to Excel to review on your desktop at your leisure. Save it, send it to your school leaders to ensure their counts are accurate. You can also click on the link, the school, and see the, the information drilled down to the student level. Question, for the special education child count, should we just follow the information emailed to us? Yes, I would definitely follow the information emailed to you. Now we're going to take a look at the student level reports. The UPSFF student level report corresponds with the summary report we were just reviewing, but at the student level. LEAs are responsible for reviewing all data in the student level report for your accuracy, validity, and completeness. Again, in the student level report, there are different uh, pieces of functionality to help LEAs review. There are three different views across the top that filter the population based on different populations of interest. So the UPSFF population, the child count population, and then the non-public population. Non-public students are not eligible for the UPSFF population. So none of your students placed at non-public institutions will be present on the UPSFF population report. You can export any of these reports to Excel. Now I'm going to review some of the additional support tools and resources available to review the results. First are the demographic filters. And the student level report, at the top of each view of the student level report, there are filters there that you can select drop down menus to see how many students are being counted for each population. So, and that, based on, oops, based on the subgroup you select, that will change the counts that you see in the chart to the left. So let me just show you what that looks like. So as you can see, I'm logging into SLED. And this is all test data, training data that's been sanitized and does not reflect actual students. I select the student level.
at the top there are my three different views and I'm interested in the UPSFF population and so I scroll down and I can see immediately of all the students in my LEA who I submitted on October 5th of those five came back from the enrollment auditors as not having been enrolled and then 6,655 were determined by the auditors to be enrolled. Now of those, if I want to see how many Hispanic students I have, I select that filter, press apply, and I scroll down. I don't have any Hispanic students. So let's clear the filter. Let's see how many male students we have. I apply the filter and I scroll down. Of those who I submitted, I submitted 3,270 males. Of those, 3,268 males were found to be enrolled and two males were found not to be enrolled. Now, if you look at the data and look at a certain population and see it's far fewer than what you know at your LEA is true, this gives you a quick sense of, of what SLED is seeing and what's going to be counted for your final enrollment data set. Questions about the filters that have been provided in the student level reports to allow you to quickly see students in subpopulations. Question, does this take into account all stage five enrollments? What if I have a student, what if I have used a stage five entry code but the student never attended? The enrollment audit population from October 5th only accounted for stage five enrollments. And what a stage five enrollment means, the student actually showed up to your school and was receiving services. Students don't reach stage five until they have received services from your LEA. Only those students should be populated in the October 5th report, and only those students would actually be counted based on the auditor review. If there are students who are um, were incorrectly identified as stage five enrollments who actually never showed up, they registered for the school but were no-shows, those students should have been found to be not enrolled by the auditor. And if that is not the case, then uh, you should be submitting an appeal to have that information corrected. Question, how are the out-of-state tuition payers treated? Out-of-state tuition payers are, you know, the enrollment process is followed exactly the same as it would be for in-state non-tuition payers. Their enrollment status is determined, their residency status is confirmed that they are not residents, and um, the tuition amount that they're paying is recorded by the auditors. They're not treated any differently. They would also be present in this report. So here's a question. A student was there on count day and was added in by the auditor, but was not counted. The student has been there since day one. How can we get this corrected? This is a great example of something that definitely should be appealed. Um, if the student was found by the auditor, what needs to happen is not only do they need to be found by the auditor, but you need to make sure their enrollment information is entered properly into your student information system because students are not going to be eligible to be included in their audit population unless data is coming through to SLED that shows they were enrolled as of October 5th. So there are two pieces. One, you need to make sure the auditors have, you know, are aware that the student should be added, and the second is getting the data right in what's going to SLED, so getting it right in your student information system. And at this point, if the student's not showing up, you need to submit an appeal to request that the student be added and submit the same documentation that you did to the auditors. 
Another question, will there be any additional elaboration on special education as my purposes involve child count? So child count data are eligible to be appealed at this point. Um, we are not here to talk about that, but you're welcome to email aussie.enrollmentaudit at dc.gov and we'll happily address those questions. Um, but the, the child count data has been present in SLED and being refreshed um, throughout the entire child count process. And uh, so this is just to talk about the results of the enrollment audit data that just came back from the auditors. Yes. Question, can you please clarify what tuition paid indicator refers to? Tuition paid indicator means was the student, is the student obligated to pay tuition? Okay, here, AJ, AJ Calper is here with me um, and I will let him elaborate on this. So the tuition paid indicator are for students that have identified as non-residents at the beginning of the school year and on, are on Aussie's list of tuition um, paying students. So if, if a student is marked as tuition paid yes, and you feel they should not actually be paying tuition, then you need to submit an appeal for that. If a student is marked tuition paid indicator no, that means they're not supposed to be paying tuition, which is the vast majority of students enrolled in our DC public education system. Another question, how is at risk defined? At risk is defined, um, I can go through those components, but it's also present in the Enrollment Audit Handbook, which is published on the Aussie website, the different components. I can describe those quickly though. Students qualify for at risk who um, are identified as direct certification, who uh, are under the care of Child and Family Services Agency, who are identified as homeless, or who are high school students who are more than a year older than their expected grade for their age. Based on September 30th. Based on September 30th. Yes, that's correct. Question, can we view the columns that make up the at-risk indicator? Yes, since you're asking, I will show you the different columns that are available in the student level report so you can get a quick sense of that. So I scroll down to my student level data. And now I'm scrolling to the right because I know that's where this data lives. And you can see, Board of the State, that means under the care of Child and Family Services, Direct Certification Indicator, Overage Indicator, and Homeless Indicator. If any one of these are yes, this will flag the at-risk indicator being yes. So this student is Direct Certification Indicator yes, so you see they're being identified as at-risk yes. I'm going to keep going because I want to show you guys the tools. I'm happy to keep answering questions. You've got great questions about data elements. Um, and, and so I, I'd like to keep going to show you the other great tools that we've made available for your review. But um, I really appreciate these questions and we're happy to continue addressing them after the webinar also. But let me keep going in my slides, please. So the next... Um, tool available are the delta fields. The delta fields uh, accompany every enrollment and en audited enrollment field, I'm sorry, audited data field, and the deltas identify cases where a student's information changed from October 5th to the preliminary findings posted on December 16th. So you can see here if a student's enrollment indicator was no, Presumably on October 5th, they were enrolled, yes. So if it's marked no, the enrollment delta field says yes. That means something changed. Let me show you what that looks like in our training data. So here you can see the enrollment indicators no, and there's a delta yes. So if I just want to see only the students where something changed, you can filter and just look at those students whose enrollment status changed. 
So for all those students whose, whose status has changed for each of these fields, there's going to be a reason. And it's going to explain some notes provided by F.S. Taylor, the auditor, about why that student's cha status changed. So in this example we see on the screen, if the enrollment indicators know, the reason is no evidence of attendance was provided between September 21st and October 22nd. Um, and then we can actually look at a few more different reasons. Another reason could be well actually that's all. But another reason could be if a student withdrew before October 5th. I've seen that reason in there. Another reason could be if a student is duplicatively enrolled with another student they would be marked as enrolled equals no and you would have to submit an appeal to you know, make the case that the student was actually enrolled at your school on October 5th. Oh goodness. Okay, so before I go into the process for submitting appeals, uh, I wanted to, first, I wanted to highlight just two more things. Uh, the, 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 what I just showed you, these tools, the delta and the reasons not approved, are only present for audited data fields. If um, any of the demographic data fields, such as race, ethnicity, students' uh, date of birth, are incorrect, that's not flagged in the delta fields. Aussie has created a report that's uh, was uploaded to your SFTP sites that highlights cases where a student's uh, gender, ethnicity, date of birth, in, in cases where any of those data fields changed because we've seen a significant number of changes in students' uh, records since October 5th. And right now, what's showing in the audit file is what existed on October 5th. If what the updated information says is actually accurate, you need to submit an appeal and, and ask us to make that correction to the audit data set. We are not going to change what existed on October 5th because it was certified until, unless you submit an appeal for that student and say, please go, this student's ethnicity is Hispanic, not, you know, what it was on October 5th. I'm just pausing for questions. Do the farms fields for students in the audit data take into account whether the school the student attends is eligible for community eligibility? The data field that's called economically disadvantaged definitely does take that into account. Economically disadvantaged combines direct certification, farms information provided by the LEA, and community eligibility. So the the economically disadvantaged field does that does take that into account. The farms information is self-reported by the LEAs through the uh, student information system. So if the LEA has input that data and marked all of their students free because they're a community eligible program, then yes, it would also take it into account in the farms field. There are some students with a duplicative exception that are marked enrolled equals yes. If the student is marked in role equals yes, you don't need to submit an appeal. Is there a difference between the ethnicity column and the race ethnicity column? Yes. Ethnicity column is just an indicator of whether the student is Hispanic or not, whereas the race ethnicity column combines race and ethnicity. So the way that works is if a student's ethnicity is Hispanic, it overrides whatever the race value was. Otherwise, the race value will be showing. If a student is multiple races and not Hispanic, then it will show multiracial in the race ethnicity column.
Another question, what would be the supporting documentation required for the appeals process on farm status change? Uh, I invite you to look at the appeals guide um, and it basically for that field, you just need to have the data correctly coming through SLED. There's no additional documentation that needs to be submitted. So you would just list that student on the roster, um, on the appeals roster, it, with the corrected value. And we will compare that against what we're seeing in SLED. If they match, then we accept the appeal. Let's still mean FTP demographic change. Oh, yes. Yeah. The direct certification report in SLED has more direct certified students than the audit report, should they match. So when you look at sheer counts, you can't compare apples to apples because the direct certification report in SLED is based on your current population, whereas the direct certified counts in the enrollment audit report are based on your October 5th population. So they should not match if you had any students enter since October 5th or if any students have left. But the, if a student is direct certified in your, um, they, they should match on an individual student basis. If a student was direct certified in, in one report, they should, they should be direct certified in the audit roster also. Question, so if the student is marked as enrolled, we don't have to appeal for the students with residency exceptions. So if a student is marked enrolled, you don't have to appeal for their enrollment status. If a student is marked as a residency exception and marked residency indicator no, I would definitely recommend submitting an appeal if that information is inaccurate. But it wouldn't be an enrollment appeal, it would be a residency appeal. I've seen a few comments here about the enrollment grade level delta. It looks like there are many yeses, but no real apparent change. Uh, that's something that I will take offline and review um, what, what's being flagged and make sure that flag is working appropriately. What it should be doing is comparing the October 5th grade level to the grade level um, verified by the auditors and highlighting um, any differences, marking yeses in, in cases where grade levels have changed. If that but thank you for, for flagging that for me. I'll take that offline and, and, and look into it. Also, if you're seeing, um, if you have questions about the comments in the reason columns, please sub submit questions to aussie.enrollmentaudit at dc.gov and we'll investigate those. The reasons were submitted by F.S. Taylor and uh, we, we will definitely seek clarity if any of the reasons are not clear. If a student, if an LEA has a cutoff birth date of 1231, can a child that turns three after 910, but before 1231 be counted as left? Yes. And if they're not, submit an appeal. What if after January 5th, I find some of my students have an incorrect race code? Will Aussie allow for those changes? No. This is your final opportunity. You, we've extended the review window. So if you find discrepancies, you need to identify those and submit an appeal on or before January 5th. So with that said, I'm going to transfer over to talking about the uh, appeals process. Oh, one question, is the SLED login the same as the QuickBase login? No, it is not. Your QuickBase login was uh, created, you know, self-created. Aussie doesn't maintain those usernames or passwords. The, the SLED login is managed by the SLED team. And if you forget your SLED login, please email uh, sled.info at dc.gov. All right, 
So submitting your appeals. Appeals guidance can be found on the Aussie website at the following link. Please read the guidance and follow it explicitly. The appeals package must include the roster listing of all students being appealed in Excel format. It also must uh, include an appeals form for each student listed on the roster. Appeals forms are used to separate one appeal from the next, so uh, we know when students are changing. And so that, that's kind of the structure. If you have a student appeal and then supporting documentation, then you would submit another form between the different students being appealed. And then there should be supporting documentation for each appeal if that's applicable. For demographic re appeals requests, that's not applicable. The only thing that needs to be true for a demographic appeal is that the data needs to be accurate in SLED. But again, please review the appeals guide because this is all laid out. Again, appeals are due to Aussie by January 5th. Appeals get submitted through the Enrollment Audit and Child Count QuickBase application. So what you do is navigate to the QuickBase application, roll in, log in with your credentials, and then you know find your user, Enrollment Audit or LEP, and then scroll down to the Desktop Appeals, click on that, and you'll see this report showing across the top. You see the appeals roster, there's one place for that, and there's a place to submit each type of appeal. You click on the edit icon, which is the pencil, and then for each of these, you would browse and attach a document, and then press save. I want to highlight that you can upload more than one document to each of these different fields, However, only the last document will be visible. If you click on the revisions, you'll be able to see all the documents that were submitted, and Aussie and the auditors will review all the documents submitted, not just the last one. So with that, I'm going to pause and go back to my questions. Will we be able to obtain a copy of this PowerPoint? Absolutely. We are publishing this presentation and the PowerPoint on the Aussie website today. It was the link where we are publishing it is uh, provided in the in the email that was sent out by the superintendent yesterday. So, uh, can you define how LEP is being how is LEP being defined? So uh, LEP is Limited English Proficient. That is submitted by LEAs through their student information systems, and it's read into SLED. That's the universe for the LEP sample audit. After that point, we compare who is being identified as LEP against uh, the access for ELLs results. If students have scored proficient in the past, they would uh, be deemed not eligible to be LEP. However, if a student is uh, was proficient and then re-identified by the LEA as needing to continue to receive LEP services, the LEA can submit an appeal to request that that student be added to the roster, but you need to submit the supporting documentation if that's the case. Uh, the other thing that we look for is uh, ensuring that the student is within the eligible age range, which is between the ages of 3 and 21. After that point, the auditors uh, take a sample of the remaining students who need to be, whose documents need to be reviewed. And that's how uh, the determination is made. So question, um, what does residency exception equal yes and rationale no exceptions mean? So um, there is no field called residency exception. There is a field called residency indicator. Residency indicator, um, as described above in the chart, if the student's residency indicator is yes, that means the student is found to be a resident. If the student is found to be a resident, no appeal is needed. Mm -hmm. 
I have a um In SLED, the option for uploading documents is not yet available. How can we troubleshoot this? Thank you for flagging that. I will uh, make sure that the option for uploading is available by the end of the day today. Uh, in, in QuickBase. No, no uploading to SLED, just in QuickBase. I'm sorry if I said that wrong. So I can go back to the dates. The question is by what date will Aussie have uh, results from the appeals. The timeline is shown here. The uh, post appeals results will be published in SLED on January 19th. If we have address changes, is it particularly important for us to appeal? Is the data really used for anything? Yes, appeal those. You know, you can make an argument of whether it's important or not, but we do use the data for various, you know, location, wards. yeah, ward information, um, anything we report out by wards, and um, anything that exists on a, in this data set, you're, you're going to have to live with. So if you're comfortable living with the data being wrong, then that's a decision, but um, I would highly recommend appealing any changes. Are write-in students included in the UPSFF population? I'll let AJ answer that. So some write-in students would be there if all of their documentation was accepted, if these, all their documentation wasn't accepted, accepted, then they wouldn't be there. A question? If a student's residency indicator is no and there's no exception, what step should be taken? If their residency indicator is no, that means they're not being counted as a resident. If there's no reason, please email us and um, we, can, we can investigate this. Again, the reasons were provided by the auditor, and um, if there is not clarity, we will seek clarity, but we need to, you to let us know where something is not clear. In what module will the post-appeals process be available? Again, all, all of the audit data is, going, is published for each phase in SLED in the exact same place. So when the post appeals come out, it will just replace what's currently in SLED. A uh, follow-up question about an address change. Yes, the address change only requires an appeals roster with the corrected data in SLED. That is accurate. That's all you need to do is include that student with the correct address in your appeals roster. There's no additional documentation that needs to be submitted. How can you find out which write-ins were not accepted? If your student if the student who was a write-in is not present on your audit roster with an enrolled equals yes or not present at all on the audit roster, that means they were not accepted. Again, there are two different ways that the student needs to be accepted. They need to have all the documentation and the auditor needs to accept them and then their data needs to be accurate and SLED. If either one of those conditions are not met, the student either will be on your roster as enrolled equals no or not added at all. I, there were a number of questions coming in, so if you still have additional ones that I didn't address, please type those in here. Again, if you don't mind. There was one question asking me to go back two slides, um, but I'm not sure which slide it is that you wanted to see. If you could just let me know. <clears throat> 